Andrea Stuger has been involved in the development of Lustre since its inception. From early prototypes in 2000 before the founding of Cluster File Systems through Sun Microsystems, Oracle, and WAM Cloud, over the next 15 years, Andreas was one of the lead Lustre developers. After Intel's acquisition of WAM Cloud in 2012, Andreas moved into the position of Lustre Principal Architect, where he continues to lead Lustre feature development. Andreas studied electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Calgary. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andreas Dilger. Hi, today I'm talking about um, the plans for uh, Lustre 2.11 and um, future versions. Uh, Peter Jones has covered what's you know arriving, you know in 2.10, even though it's still a little bit in the future, it's not um, too far away. Um, just a, a quick recap: so, uh, Montreal Lnet. Um, Amir talked about that. That's work continuing in 2.11. Um, progressive file layouts is a, a great feature, 2.10. Um, ZFS work in continuing. And um, 2.11 is also going to have um, some interesting features uh, in, addition, in addition to those continuing uh, developments. Um, data on MDT is something that's been coming for quite a while. Uh, file level redundancy is a feature near and dear to my heart that's finally um, basically working today and um, you know will be delivered in 2.11 or the first phase of it. Um, more work with DNE for ease of use and um, you know we've got some things already uh, underway for 2.12 and 2.13. Um, you know I personally don't like to you know tout features that are you know, just a, an idea that we're talking about. I only like to talk about features that are actually, you know, there's somebody working on it or, um, you know, we have concrete designs and things. Um, so, you know, there's, Lustre is, you know, first and foremost, a file system that, uh, you know, goes fast. And, um, you know, that continues to be the case. Um, you know, we're investing time and effort into, uh, um, you know, making sure that Lustre keeps pace with new hardware that's coming around. And uh, today, you know, I mean, we have pretty good specs. I'm not going to read everything out, but, um, you know, we can do about what, you know, one network interface can do about what, uh, you know, is available. You can attach storage to servers, but, you know, of course, storage is getting faster. Networks are getting faster. Um, so, you know, we have to make improvements in these areas. And um, I think we're, you know, doing a fairly good job. Um, you know, multi-rail LNET is going to let us, you know, and, and other work for OPA and InfiniBand. Um, you know, we can keep pace with, uh, you know, individual interfaces going, um, you know, 10 gigabytes a second. But, you know, more importantly, we can start scaling out the number of interfaces that we can have in a server. And, um, you know, IOPS on both the, the MDS and the OSS, um, you know, we're continuing to look at um, improving um, performance there. And uh, one of the interesting areas that's coming in 2.11 is being able to handle small files efficiently, right? Um, being Having a, a lighter weight, um, you know, or a more efficient I.O. stack on the client to handle small writes and things. Um, and so, you know, in aggregate, I think we're doing quite well. I mean, each of these these areas needs, you know, concentrated work on a, on a bunch of smaller parts. And so I'm going to go into what all of the different parts are. Um, so there's, you know, an area that uh, Intel is investing in quite a bit is uh, improving ZFS performance. Um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, say that we're not interested in LDISCFS either. Most of the users still use LDISCFS. It's really more that ZFS was a lot farther behind LDISCFS in terms of performance. And, um, um, you know, it, it needed more care and feeding to get the metadata um, performance up. So, 
you know, it just in the workloads that ZFS was previously involved in, you know, database-y kind of user home directories, you know, people aren't creating a million files, you know, all in one shot. So we went from, you know, 5,000-ish creates per second up to tens of thousands. Um, you know, it speculate maybe 30, 40,000 in, in 2.10, but we're going to keep on pushing that for 2.11 and um, work going into ZFS itself will help on that front. Um, there's also um, other changes in the, you know, infrastructure of ZFS itself that, um, you know, we've been helping with um, hardware assisted checksums uh, and compression and um, improving um, memory management is, I mean, we contributed a little bit to that one um, through the, the Coral project. There's a bunch of other people. I can't, not enough room on the slide to list them all, but that's been a big uh, improvement for ZFS in the next release. Um, improved fault management, um, you know, and like all of the ZFS ones, it's a community effort, right? It's a very good open project. Um, so we had one of our dedicated developers working on that. Um, Multi-mount protection is a very important feature that's existed in LDISCFS that uh, Livermore is um, working on for, um, you know, protecting failover and things with the ZFS level. And uh, um, in 2.10, we had project accounting, um, project quota for uh, LDISCFS, um, and we have a developer working on the equivalent functionality for ZFS so that you can have project quota for ZFS. Um, there's other more significant features going in, um, probably not in the, in the upcoming release, or definitely not in the upcoming release, but these are substantially finished today. And um, the declustered parity uh, VDEVs for ZFS is a, a quite interesting thing, mostly for HPC, right? This is, people are not gonna have you know, very often 50 drive or 100 drive JBODs per server, you know, in your business environment. But um, in the HPC environment, that's definitely um, of interest. And so that's uh, a feature that's being developed um, in conjunction with Argonne National Lab. And uh, the other one, metadata allocation class, allows you to um, store, you know, ZFS internal metadata on either separate disk devices in mirrored mode compared to, you know, uh, RAID, or um, on separate, you know, physical media like SSDs, which I think most people will be interested in. And so it's essentially like, you know, a little Lustre file system inside the file system for ZFS now, right? You have a separation of data and metadata. It worked, you know, it worked for us. Why shouldn't it work for ZFS, right? And, um, you know, this improves not only your, you know, file access, file create performance, but also scanning and scrubbing things that need to traverse all of the ZFS metadata. Um, LNET, um, multi-rail, dynamic discovery, health network, I won't really cover that at all. Um, but, uh, you know, ongoing work for 2.11 and 2.12. Um, data on MDT. Uh, there's been a whole presentation on this, but it's actually, um, you know, just wanted to highlight that this is a feature that is, you know, really in, in uh, you know, the final stages of development for 2.11. Um, you know, with progressive file layouts, we had to do a bit of restructuring um, of the data on MDT code to integrate well with progressive file layouts, but um, it's really something that um, actually helped data on MDT um, to be more flexible. And so now, you know, you'll be able to do things like, you know, store the, um, you know, small files on MDTs and you can specify is it a megabyte, is it 64K or 32K, whatever you consider a small file. But you can store the first part of your file on the MDT and if it grows larger, then it moves over to the OSTs and things like that. And, um, you know, this is even if you're not doing small files, for many, you know, HPC workloads, the beginning of the file is something like uh, an index or whatever, and you might be fetching that or, you know, some, some 
um, application metadata stored at the beginning, you know, you don't have to read um, the whole file and you can fetch this all from the MDT uh, in a single shot, right? And so um, data on MDT is going to, you know, reduce RPC overhead by, you know, two or three, four RPCs per file access, right? And you get size on MDS for free with this and, um, you know, for small files. So it's, it's uh, really going to help in one of the, you know, sort of weaker areas for Lustre. Um, my favorite feature is uh, file level redundancy. And, um, you know, this really um, wouldn't have been at the stage where it is without the work that was done for um, progressive file layouts. Um, they both share some inf uh, infrastructure um, in terms of how to describe um, composite files. And, um, you know, while for huge sites, they may not be interested in, you know, mirroring in your 50 petabyte file system, triple mirrored. Um, there's still a lot of value, I think, for HPC environments. Um, you know, you can do things um, like all files in Lustre. You could set a file system-wide policy or directory-wide policy for your um, striping. Um, you can also set it, the mirroring on a per file basis, you know, so you could say mirror one checkpoint a day or something like that so that, you know, that's robust against an OST failure because today, no matter how you slice and dice your file, is it striped, you know, a, a large file striped over all the OSTs, is it a file per process, you know, that are all, again, written across all the OSTs. Um, you know, if one of the OSTs is down, you can't start your application. And, um, you know, at least this way, you'd have redundancy to start your application. You might lose some amount of computation, but, you know, you would avoid having to wait for that OST to be brought up continuous, um, you know, depending if it's lost permanently, you know, you would have to restore from backup. Um, you know, integration with a job scheduler, you can mirror your input files at the beginning of, you know, being added to the job queue. And so, you know, your application will be able to start no matter what the state is, right? And, um, you know, this is the way that we can finally get more robust than what the individual hardware provides underneath us. So the first phase of development for, um, file redundancy is um, uh, what we call uh, delayed um, mirroring. And essentially what that means is that there'll be, um, you know, you can create your file, it will be written in, a, in an unmirrored form initially, and then there'll be a, a, essentially a, a, a daemon um, that's watching for files that need to be resynced. And um, so you won't get immediate redundancy, but within, you know, minutes of your file being created, you'd have a mirrored copy. And um, the client would be able to, to access either copy, um, depending on, you know, if OSCs are available, it can make these decisions in a couple of seconds, uh, depending on, you know, the average I.O. Um, round trip time. But, um, you know, the, the client doesn't really care how the mirror got created. It will just see that there's a mirror on this file that timed out waiting for one OST. It can read the copy from the other OST. And so this isn't, I mean, I want to emphasize that uh, the phase one is not, you know, mirroring for every use case and every application, right? It depends on, um, you know, what sort of reliability you need. It's definitely not intended to say, you don't need RAID or failover or anything for your OSTs. Um, but uh, as we move through the different phases of development, the, uh, you know, there'll be more functionality added, right? Uh, phase two is adding in what we call immediate mirroring, which allows the clients to, to write, you know, two or three copies of the file data, you know, immediately as it's generated so you can withstand a failure at the time of um, writing, and it would still use, um, you know, the demons and inf infrastructure from phase one to do resync if a, if a OST goes offline during writes, but you would have, you know, your two copies right away. Um, and uh, there's more work um, to be done in terms of scaling out um, 
you know, the resync engines to be parallel, um, handling, you know, full OST failures efficiently, um, being able to specify, you know, policies to say, you know, files from this user or that are older than, you know, a certain age, you can migrate them between tiers, right? Um, the, uh, um, you know, in the last phase that we have, um, you know, discussed is uh, erasure coding. It's actually, you know, um, you know, not a super complex extension to uh, to the the mirroring. Um, this would again be a delayed um, erasure coding, so you wouldn't be generating erasure coded files right when you're writing them, but uh, rather doing it as a you know post processing step on you know dedicated clients or from the OSTs, and um, you know that would avoid having the you know double or triple overhead of of mirroring but while still allowing clients to uh, have reliable access to file data. Um, on the other side, um, DNE has been in, um, you know, the DNE2 has been in Lustre since 2.8, 2.9. Um, and uh, so it's there, it's functional. Um, there's still, you know, usability improvements that we could make. And you know we're starting to make them. Um, one of the things that you can do today for from DNE one, you can migrate you know a, a single directory from one MDT to another MDT or a directory tree. Um, what you can't do today is migrate you know um, from a single stripe directory to a multi stripe directory. So that's something that you know we already have a patch for, and we're reviewing that. Um, this will, you know, allow you to, to improve the performance of large directories that exist, you know, if you didn't know at the time that, uh, you know, they would be need to be striped. Um, taking that idea a little bit further, the uh, automatic directory restriping is essentially the idea that if your file, you know, you don't know in advance, it's the same sort of like PFL for directories, right? You don't know in advance how big this directory is going to be. Um, you know, users typically, you know, don't know these things in advance. They don't plan for them. And so your directory grows, you know, a little bit large, you know, five or 10,000 entries. We don't know what the threshold will be yet. But um, once it grows past a certain size, then you can automatically split the directory. And then users, you know, won't have to do anything, but they'll start getting parallel performance from a single directory, you get better load balancing, you use your other MDT's uh, performance automatically. And, um, you know, the uh, it's possible for the, you know, existing entries to be automatically migrated. They don't have to, but it makes lookups a bit more efficient. But these are all things that, you know, happen, you know, without the, uh, the input of the user. And so I think that'll make, um, DNE a lot more useful for people. Um, I think one of the other things that we'll be looking at, we haven't really started development on this, but there's you know infrastructure in the code for it to have MDT pools so that you can manage things like um, you know certain users get this MDT, other users get another MDT, or you can um, have different classes of MDTs. Um, let's say with a burst buffer, you'd have a local burst buffer MDT with the burst buffer OSTs and um, then, you know, when the data moves off of the burst buffer, you know, it's also migrated out of the MDT. Um, there's a number of other um, miscellaneous features that are um, ready for 2.11. Um, the client lock ahead um, feature through LAdvise so that applications or more typically libraries um, doing shared file I.O. can get better performance um, by requesting you know, file write locks in advance of actually writing the data so that they don't um, get false contention. Because Lustre itself um, automatically expands file lock requests if there's not contention. And of course, the first client that opens a file says, hey, no contention on this file. It gets the full file lock. And then, 
shortly thereafter, you know, 100,000 other processes pile on and say, hey, I want that lock too. Um, so the, if the application knows you're going to have an I.O. pattern like that, it can, you know, be smart about doing this. And I don't expect people to change their applications. It'll be in MPI and things like that. Um, network request scheduler, I mean, DDN has had a pro uh, discussion and the University of uh, Mainz um, to improve the flexibility and the ability of the servers to, um, you know, manage, you know, thousands of, of requests more efficiently and, you know, balance users' um, demands against each other. Uh, James just talked about the trace points. Um, small file writes. So, you know, this is kind of one of the Achilles heels of Lustre is, um, so the, the, um, the data on MDT will handle small files, right? But it's not necessarily improving the efficiency of small writes to large files. And um, so, you know, we're, we're starting to look into, um, you know, making the client IO stack and the, the you know, method of, of handling, you know, 4K, 8K, 16K size writes to be uh, lighter weight and more efficient um, so that uh, you can just get higher IOPS through Lustre. And, you know, Seagate presented on um, LDISCFS improvements. Um, you know, many of these are, um, you know, also similar to the ZFS work, it, you know, it's, it's being um, discussed with upstream developers and, um, you know, we're actually, um, just yesterday, a Google pushed one of the luster patches um, for large extended attributes, you know, to go into the upstream EXC4. So there's, um, you know, still good collaboration um, with EXC4 development. Um, you know, I think we've um, had, we have had a presentation um, from University of Mainz. Um, University of Hamburg is doing ZFS um, compression, client-side compression, which is a quite an interesting project. You know, lots of compute cycles on the clients. If you can send less data over the network, store less data on the disk, often um, you get a, um, a benefit, multiple benefits there. Um, uh, the global NRS scheduling and, um, you know, integration with uh, cloud um, computing environments, big data is uh, definitely interesting. So Intel is funding some of these. Um, so there wasn't a presentation this year about this, but client-side compression is, I think, quite interesting. Um, so they've actually, you know, they're looking at using compression as essentially a cost um, reduction, right? So they, they can get, you know, specify a less, uh, you know, um, performant network, less performant disks, uh, use the cycles that are, you know, typically sitting idle while you're doing I.O. on the client, and you can get a better throughput than what your hardware would otherwise allow, right? The, the compression speeds these days are, um, you know, in the gigabytes a second, and, um, you know, handling this efficiently from the client um, integrating ZFS already has, um, you know, the ability to do data compression on disk. So what we need is an end-to-end -end, um, sort of integration of writing, you know, compressed data on disk in a way that, you know, you can access it efficiently um, after the fact. And, um, you know, so they're showing, this is actually a Beijing Genomics Institute um, showing performance of um, gzip with ZFS. This is not Lustre, but this is just showing that, uh, you know, with no compression, um, you know, you can get a certain speed that's basically limited by the speed of the hardware, but actually with some of the, uh, you know, LZ4, which is just a pure software implemented compression, you're exceeding the speed of the hardware. Um, you know, I don't want to tout Intel exactly, but there's, you know, a compression hardware engine that is doing gzip as an offload engine, and, um, you know, it can get a fairly good performance. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, with the improved performance, I mean, gzip is very expensive. LZ4 is actually not very expensive, so that's the pink line at 20% CPU usage. You know, with hardware offload, if you want to get 
you know, really high throughput um, and still keep your CPU reasonable so that it can be doing all of the other things. Um, and sort of longer term projects in terms of, um, you know, 2.13, I think really that, uh, you know, we're just starting to get into the golden age of luster in terms of, you know, we're getting all of these cool features, um, you know, the functionality in terms of tiered storage, um, redundancy, uh, you know, policy engines, right? It, it takes a long time for an ecosystem like this to develop, but I think that there's lots of, uh, um, you know, lots of um, interesting things that can just start to be done today. Um, so the data uh, tiering, um, metadata redundancy, we're just starting, you know, sort of architectural level discussions about how do we um, mirror, you know, data between MDTs. And I mean, the data, the file level replication is important because you typically have, you know, hundreds or thousands, maybe not typically, but some systems have hundreds or thousands of OSTs. Um, and so you're, you know, the number of points of failure is very high. You know, the MDT, it typically has better um, hardware, you know, SSDs and things like this fails less often. Um, but, you know, it's still a single point of failure. So being able to, to mirror that data um, and provide availability even when an MDT goes offline is, is uh, sort of the next thing that's uh, getting attention. And so we're just having, um, you know, some, some designing work done there. And um, so, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the luster of the future is, is uh, you know, fairly interesting, right? I mean, as, as FLR, you know, um, moves forward, having, you know, totally non-redundant um, OSTs would be possible with erasure coding. Um, you know, you have different classes of storage. Um, you know, for different workloads, but it will be um, transparent to the application, right? You won't have to say read from or write from this directory if you need mirroring or burst buffer or whatever and write to that directory if you need something else. I mean, it will be, you know, one namespace and the file system uh, can manage the different, um, manage the different classes of storage internally. And with that, I'm finished. Any questions? Hi there. Um, with the file level um, replication, or at least as it stands at the moment, um, how, how does it work when uh, like an OST goes offline? Um, do all kind of updates immediately start going to the replica? Um, so in the in in phase one, right, it's basically read only, right? So if you have a replica, um, if one of the OSTs goes offline, the clients will detect that through a timeout, or if there's an external health mechanism, um, the clients will detect that the OST is offline and immediately start reading from the other OSTs. In the phase two, when there's there's write um, immediate write mirroring. It will be, you know, it will detect again timeout, and um, the clients will notify the MDS that, uh, um, you know, this OST is unresponsive. That OST will be marked. Um, this the component that holds that OST will be marked stale, and it will be logged into the change log. And so the writes will continue to the one or more other replicas of the file. And, um, you know, when the OST comes back, they'll, the change log monitor, to, you know, process uh, will resync the data from that. And so, I mean, there's going to be, you know, multiple levels of improvement that you can do in terms of how efficient is the resync. Is it just a single threaded process? Is it running in parallel for large files? You know, we've talked about having essentially like a dirty bitmap or something like that 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 uh, makes the amount of data you have to resync, you know, reduced. Um, even with the PFL, you know, you would only get um, 
you know, right off the bat, you'd only get one component marked stale, depending on which OST it's on. So, you know, you can improve the things. My, my um, philosophy is that, you know, it's better to have the functionality there and then make it more efficient over time rather than, you know, perfect is kind of the en enemy of the good, right? So does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, does, does it have any implication or any ideas down the road for how that might kind of affect or um, work with the HSM um, system? Because some of, some of that kind of feature sounds really like what like we would like, for instance, out of uh, HSM in some way. It's like yeah, I mean, it's uh, so in in many respects, the the tiered storage inside of Lustre will be a lot like HSM, right? You'll be able to do things even in phase one, like um, pull, you know, make a mirror of your copy from your regular OSTs into like flash OSTs for burst buffer or something like that. So that would could be managed by the job scheduler. Um, you know, and then the space managed in the burst buffer flash OSTs through HSM like it does, um, you know, Robinhood can already do today, right? In terms of um, integrating with tape-based, you know, if that's what you mean by HSM, um, even the, the progressive file layouts, I think, has an interesting ability that we could start doing like partial tape restores, right? You could have different um, components of your file and um, you know you could restore the first megabytes or gigabytes of your file into one component and give it to the to the client to access, and then continue restoring into a later component while the the clients are accessing the first part. As opposed to today, you get blocked on the full file access until it's restored, right? So there's definitely room for um, you know improving the integration there. But it depends on you know whether people are really interested in that or not, right? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, everybody's ready for lunch. All right, thanks.